Talk about compaction. You can see a really harsh example of it here behind me. Uh, you can see this trail that's been well worn by lots of folks walking on it, maybe some animals too. You can see up on the hillside, uh, you've got these game trails. Bottom line is, is whenever it's, we're having a lot of compaction, whether it's from, from feet or from wheels from vehicles, uh, what's happening is that we're compressing the soil and we're, we're essentially removing the pore space, not all of it, but you know, more than we'd like. We, we, we typically would say an ideal soil is about 50% pore space and 50% solids. But when I become compacted, the solids percentage goes way up and the pore space goes down, which is a problem. It, it basically removes macro pores, so I have a hard time moving water into and through the soil. And it's not conducive for plant growth, as you can see. There's no plants growing on that trail. And uh, we see the same things in, uh, in the urban landscape in, in our yards. We get too much traffic, we can cause that compaction, which results in plants not being very healthy. Okay, so left to its own devices, uh, does the soil recover when it's compacted? Maybe uh, the, the actions of freezing and thawing uh, over time can cause that soil to loosen up. Uh, de partially depends on what kind of soil it is. Like some soils are more prone to shrinking and swelling if they have the right kind of clays in them, for example. Uh, like behind me, this is an area that was used to be driven on all the time. It hasn't been for many years, but you can still see the impacts of the compaction because we haven't done anything to alleviate the compaction. But you can also see that I've got plants that are starting to come in. And that's another thing. Plants will kind of loosen up the soil over time as well. But you can go to some places like, for example, where the, the pioneers that came west in the United States, we have places along that trail that are still compact. You can see the wagon wheel tracks to this day, uh, almost two centuries later. So when we wanna prevent compaction, there's a number of things we can do. Uh, the first thing is having a proper design to control traffic in high traffic areas. Uh, you can see in these uh, pictures that we've got some problem areas that are, that are funneling traffic in a certain direction. Another thing is to control the moisture of the soil when we do have traffic. If I have an event that I'm going to have a lot of traffic, or if I've got a situation where, like for example, I've got a mow and I'm using big heavy mowers, it's important that the soil is not too wet or too dry. When the soil is saturated, it has very poor soil strength. It'll just fall apart. You can think about the sand at the beach. The sand that is best for a sand castle is when it has a little bit of moisture in it. If it's too wet, it just falls apart. If it's too dry, it just falls apart. So it's similar for our soils with traffic. Um, when we have a little bit of moisture in the soil, uh, it, it'll kind of hold together better and resist uh, having compaction a little bit. It, it'll still get compacted, but it, it'll resist it better when the moisture is right. Not all soils are gonna get compacted. For example, my front yard and my backyard get hardly any traffic. I've never aerated them and they're just fine, very healthy, look good. However, you've got some places that get a lot of traffic and we've got a plan for that. We've got to have uh, practices in place to deal with aeration um, when we have compacted soils. And we can even uh, do it variably, such as on a football field, we often uh, do more intensive aeration in the middle of the field, uh, soccer in front of uh, goal mouths. Um, similar in other landscapes, places that get a lot of traffic, we need to aerate them more frequently. Don't necessarily need to do the whole place, but get, let's get the places that get a lot of traffic and get them aerated frequently. Okay, one way you can tell if you're compacted is, first of all, just look, like here's a, here's a corner. Now, the, the, the designers and installers, you know, did it wise and they didn't put a sharp corner here and they, you know, they put a rounded corner, but uh, unlike some other places, like over here behind me where you got those bollards, um, uh, there's nothing really to keep people from cutting the corner and they will. And so uh, I can take my probe and stick it in the ground and if I push down on it, and it's just almost impossible to push in, and I have to just really jump on it to get it to go down, uh, it's probably compacted. Now, if I go over here, it's uh, much easier. I, I can just, in fact, I can even push it in without even stepping on it. It's just, it's just not very compacted at all. So using a probe is, 
is one thing to do. Not everybody has a soil probe, but we all have screwdrivers and you can use that. It's not quite as effective because you can't really look at the soil and um, it's, but it is a tool that could be used is just pushing a screwdriver in the ground. Now, if it's really compacted like it is right here, where people have kind of cut the corner and have a lot of foot traffic right across here, you also, you can't really get an aeration uh, equipment in here so it never gets aerated. Uh, you try to push this screwdriver in and it just won't even hardly go in the ground at all. It's so compacted. Um, now go over here where I don't have hardly any traffic. I can push that screwdriver in no problem. It goes in really easy. So that's another indication of compaction. And you also should realize that there's a, a moisture factor. Uh, if the soil is very dry, the, these uh, screwdrivers or the soil probe, they won't go in very easy. So it's better to try to test that when you have a reasonable amount of moisture in the soil. Okay, if I've decided that I do have compaction, I've got to deal with it. How do I do that? Well, one of the first things we need to do is deal with a myth about power raking. It's often also called vertical mowing um, or dethatching. Uh, it's using a literally a vertical mower. The, the blades, instead of going uh, horizontal to the ground, they go vertical and they just tear up the thatch. And that does not deal with compaction. I mean, it might loosen up a little bit of the soil right at the surface, but that is not for compaction management. Uh, it, but it gets sold all the time as aeration, and it's just not. The only time I might need to do uh, vertical mowing is if I'm trying to put seed in contact with the with the soil, or I've got a really bad thatch problem that I've just got sort of an emergency situation. It's actually better to use core aeration with top dressing as a long-term solution for thatch management. But sometimes my thatch is just so thick that I've got to do uh, dethatching with using a power rake. Um, we want to use typically some type of uh, aerification device. And there's lots of different choices out there. Uh, we have hollow tine versus solid tine. Um, the argument for hollow tine is that it, it doesn't compress the sidewalls. If I stick this big, thick, solid tine in the ground, it's actually gonna create a little bit of sidewall compaction because it's pushing the soil to one side. Uh, but it certainly has its place with uh, the solid tines, especially if the tines are skinny. Uh, the advantage of the hollow tines is that we actually are pulling some soil out and literally loosening up the soil and creating some holes that we can put uh, top dressing sand. Of course, we can do top dressing sand with solid tine as well, and that's often a good practice that, that we would want to do that. We would go through, we would run the, the, the aeration device, and then we would top dress with sand. We'd drag off the, the cores that kind of breaks them up, or we can even vacuum them up. In the case of a perch water table system, for example, we want to maintain the height of the field. And if I'm constantly top dressing, I'm actually gaining height over years. And so I need to remove the cores in order to maintain the height of the perch water table. And, and that's typically only in high-end golf greens and sports fields. Otherwise, though, we, we just aerate. We're, we're top dressing with sand, maybe um, breaking up the, the cores uh, or vacuuming it up. And we need to think about, you know, what's the best way to do that? There's also different sizes of tines. Some are very thin. Like, for example, on a golf green, you just can't leave big holes. It's going to affect how the ball rolls. And so in some places, I need really thin tines so that we really can't see the, the holes in the ground and it doesn't affect the, the functionality of, of the surface. Um, so th those are some decisions. How deep we go. If you go the same depth all the time, it creates a problem. We get a layer of compaction, actually, that's worse. A down, like let's say I'm going down four inches all the time. Well, then five inches, I'm going to be very compacted. So sometimes I need to go shallow. Sometimes I need to go deep. Um, and we have so we have different sizes and depths of tines that can go deeper, shallower. The other thing to realize is that, that these tines are going to wear down. Uh, they, they will uh, do so because of abrasion. Uh, sand fields are ex especially prone to wearing these things down. And we have to replace the tines within two or three, four uh, aeration events. Uh, they have to be replaced. So it's not an inexpensive proposition to do core aeration. 
Another option that's used for managing compaction is air injection or water injection. Uh, instead of just using a, a solid tine or a hollow tine, uh, we can actually inject air down into the soil that has a, an effect of sort of loosening and separating the soil. It can be very effective. It's also very slow. It's tedious. Um, I can do a whole football field in a couple hours with with uh, hollow or, or solid tine aeration. However, if I want to do air infiltration, for example, it's going to take me probably several days uh, with somebody running that. You, you literally have to pull forward, you set it down in, it injects the air, it lifts up, then you have to pull forward a little bit more, and it, it's a very slow process. Uh, it's getting better, we're getting bigger machines, and it's becoming more efficient. Uh, in my experience, the air and the water injection is very effective in the short term. It doesn't really have as long-lasting effect as the hollow and, and solid tine aeration. Another option is that some aeration devices will have a rocker on them. So when the tine goes in the ground, instead of just strictly going down, it, the, the device actually shifts side to side, rocks back and forth, which has an effect of sort of lifting the soil upward. And that can be very effective, especially with deep tine aeration. Grass is particularly affected by compaction, mostly because it's easy to walk on it. Uh, we don't necessarily walk through the shrub beds and stuff, but it's, people see grass and they tend to walk on it. And it, it. It'll tolerate some of that, but if you have excessive traffic like we have right here, this is sort of a funnel. Uh, it's been created by these stairs um, right at the end of the shrub bed. It, it just sort of funnels people right through here. And all of the foot traffic has compacted this soil and we have almost no grass that's growing. 